<laughs> Visual dyslexia. The most prevalent form of dyslexic handicap is that of visual dyslexia. This is basically the inability to translate printed language symbols into meaning. Symbols, S-Y-M-B-O-L-S. Visual dyslexia has little to do with vision itself. Children with severe visual impairment are not dyslexic because of loss of sight. Visual dyslexia is not a matter of seeing poorly. It is a matter of not interpreting accurately what is seen. Most visual dyslexics are certain letter, see certain letters backwards and upside down. To read whole words in the context of a sentence is a jumbled process for such a child. Not only does he perceive individual letters incorrectly, but he also sees parts of words in reverse. When these faults are at work during reading tasks, the child has a disorganized, meaningless, and frustrating experience. Consequently, he does everything in his power to avoid reading. For example, Mike, who is handicapped by visual dyslexia, is asked to read the following paragraph silently. Down the cold, dark stairs crept the man in the black coat. Closer he came, closer and closer. Asleep in their blankets, Dan and Pete were unaware of the danger. Because of reversals, transpositions, and failure to perceive minimal cues, this is Mike's perception of the paragraph the first time he reads it. Now the could back stars kept the man in the dark coat. Cold sir he come, cold sir and cold sir sheeping the dainties and and dear war neuror for the bang. The teacher, who is unaware of the nature of Mike's reading disability, has made an issue of subvocalizing. She snaps her fingers and says, shh, when Mike mutters as he reads. The teacher does not realize that by cutting off the oral, oral, speaking and listening channels, she has made it impossible for the boy to check his visual, visual impressions against what is meaningful to him through his hearing. The result is complete nonsense for Mike, and he flunks still another comprehension quiz because of his silent reading. Had he been allowed to mumble the words, thus checking them against his hearing vocabulary, he could have slowly worked out the meaning of the passage. Because of this sort of scrambled perception, visual dyslexics are forced to work very slowly. This slowness is a factor usually misunderstood by teachers. If the typical pupil in Mike's class can digest the above passage in three minutes, it will take him at least 15 minutes as a rule. The demands for speed in reading and writing are being increased by the pressures of the modern curriculum, but visual dyslexics are incapable of such speed. When they are placed with impatient instructions, instructors who do not understand their problems, children like Mike have no way of coping with their assigned reading tasks. Because the visual dyslexic has such a constant problem handling information in sequence, he usually experiences difficulty with basic arithmetic. Learning to add, subtract, multiply, and divide involves frequent changes in direction that contradict the left to right, top to bottom orientation stressed in reading and writing. To add, Mike must start at the right side of the problem and work downward, then carry right to left to the next column. 
In simple first grade work, this orientation is not difficult. When more complex addition problems are introduced, he becomes confused by this new directionality, which is opposite to, back, backwards from, the emphasis placed in reading and writing. To subtract or multiply, Mike must start at the bottom right, exactly the opposite from the orientation for other paper-pencil work during the day. In subtracting and multiplying, he must work bottom to top, right to left. Long division involves a complex pattern of beginning left to right, then top to bottom, then bottom to top, and right to left then back to the left to right again. If reading this description makes your adult head swirl, you can imagine the confusion Mike faces when he is under pressure to hurry through arithmetic computation. He constantly loses direction and is forced to start over. When he is not given enough time to correct his directionality, he becomes enormously frustrated and confused. Visual dyslexics are generally handicapped in any situation which requires them to comprehend sequence. Pupils like Mike cannot remember the order of the months of the year, days of the week, multiplication tables, or even the day, month, and year of their birth. Mike's parents and teachers have fussed about his habit of forgetting to do routine chores or to carry out a set of instructions. The problem is not one of laziness or rebellion on his part as a rule. He simply does not perceive serial relationships. His comprehension of household duties as well as classroom tasks is as scrambled as his perception of printed symbols. It is unfortunate that such children are regarded as irresponsible. The fact is they are confused. Of the three forms of dyslexia commonly found in classrooms, visual dyslexia is the most easily corrected. Fortunately, Mike can identify discrete, separate sounds of speech, making it relatively easy for him to learn phonics. His major handicap is the inability to visualize printed symbols in correct sequence or position. Through appropriate drills, he can learn to perceive printed symbols accurately, although he will probably remain a slow reader all his life. Gradually, he can learn to identify sequence in his environment, thus reducing his conflict with adult expectations. His greatest enemies are pressure for speed and pressure for quantity of work produced. If he is given proper allowances for his limitations, Mike can become a strong student. He can even achieve advanced scholastic standing. Many adults have gained remarkable success in spite of dyslexia. The most difficult form of dyslexia to correct is the inability to perceive the discrete, separate sounds of spoken language. This is auditory dyslexia. Most auditory dyslexics have normal hearing, so far, so far as can be determined by audiometer meet tests. The basic handicap is similar to that of tone deafness toward music, a condition which spoils music appreciation for many adults. Hmm. Because the dyslexic cannot identify small differences between vowel sounds or consonant sounds, he is unable to associate specific sounds with their printed symbols. Consequently, he is very poor at spelling and composition. Traditional phonics instruction is almost meaningless to most auditory dyslexics. They simply cannot identify the discrete variations of speech sounds, nor do the rules and generalizations make sense. For example, Mary is handicapped in this way. The seriousness of her problem is illustrated most clearly when she must write without receiving help from others. Without being aware of Mary's perceptual limitations, her teacher has chosen to give a dictation test. 
While speaking clearly and slowly, the teacher dictates. What kind of celebration did the pilgrims have to show their thankfulness to God? Mary's task is to encode this sentence with no help from anyone else. As usual, her teacher becomes annoyed when Mary asks for the fifth time that the sentence be repeated. This need for repetition is characteristic of auditory dyslexics, who are never sure that they have heard correctly. As she struggles to write the sentence, Mary is acutely aware of her teacher's disapproving frown. Hmm. Under these conditions, this is the best the child can do. What sid of Selbarshan didn't the phlegms have to sauter tactfulness to gold? At her very best working speed, Mary requires from three to five minutes to encode a simple dictated sentence. Before she can finish one item, her teacher moves on to the next. As usual, Mary completes only two or three of the ten dictated sentences. Thus she has met failure again, something she has come to expect. Children like Mary are not at a serious disadvantage in standardized testing. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Children like Mary are at a serious disadvantage in standardized testing. The three most widely used intelligence tests for placing children in special classes are the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, the Wechsler, Wechsler, Wechsler? Wechsler. Intelligence Scale for Children, WISC, and the, standard, and the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. These tests involve careful listening, accurate interpretation of what is heard, quick internalization, gestalt formation, of what is heard, then identification of pictures that illustrate what the examiner said or explanation of certain information asked for by the examiner. <clears throat> Auditory dyslexics cannot score well on these verbal tests. Children like Mary usually comprehend only 30 to 40 percent of what they hear the first time. If the examiner is forbidden by standardized test procedures from repeating or rephrasing in simpler terms, Mary is stuck with only partly understood auditory concepts. She is left to guess, say nothing, or panic, depending upon her disposition. It is incredibly embarrassing to be an auditory dyslexic. Very little of what the child hears makes sense, especially on standardized tests. Mary almost never gets the point of oral situations as quickly as her peers. She sits isolated inside invisible walls, feeling dumb. Many auditory dyslexics develop cover-up behaviors that greatly irritate adults who do not understand the reason why the child acts silly or gives strange or irrelevant responses to oral statements. An auditory dyslexic is equally handicapped in naming rhyming words, interpreting diacritical markings, applying phonic generalizations, and pronouncing words accurately. Because she does not perceive differences in similar vowel sounds, Mary cannot tell the difference between big and beg unless she hears the word used in context. An easily observed aspect of her auditory limitation is her garbled pronunciation of familiar words. For example, Mary is asked to read aloud the following passage from her science book. To test for acidity, place one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda in a beaker. Measure one fourth cup of vinegar, then pour slowly over the soda be sure not to use an aluminum cup. Because she does not associate sounds and symbols accurately, she reads aloud, to test for ac 
kidati place one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda in a breaker. Measure one four cup vinegar, then pour slow over the soda. Be sure not to use a lunum cup. This tendency toward garbled speech, echolasia, often embarrasses Mary. She does not understand why others laugh at her tongue twisters. Auditory dyslexia is difficult to correct because the child is cut off from the fundamental sound slash symbol relationships which constitute literacy. It is, impos it is possible to devise drills and exercises for children like Mary, but this remedial work requires enormous patience on the part of both the teacher and the child. As a rule, auditory dyslexics must devise their own sight memory systems for coping with spelling and related tasks. Many intelligent dyslexics have mastered common spelling patterns through mnemonic memory techniques. For example, Mary has learned to spell then and when correctly by remembering. Then is hen with I, oh, I'm sorry. Then is hen with T in front. When is hen with W in front. Generally, the most effective teaching procedure for auditory dyslexia involves word families or spelling patterns. When similar configurations are structured in groups, Mary can memorize enough associations to satisfy ordinary curriculum requirements. Dysgraphia. A third type of dyslexia is the inability to coordinate hand and arm muscles to write legibly. Many bright dyslexic children have been seriously misjudged because their teachers could not read their written responses. The work of extremely dysgraphic children actually resembles chicken scratching, with few recognizable letters or word forms on the page. Often, these dissembled, dis, disabled students fill page after page with scribbling in order to appear busy. Frequently, they can read their own writing, although no one else can. It is diff difficult for such dyslexics to learn to write legibly, although certain handwriting drills can increase the legibility of their work. Usually such students can learn to type thus acquiring a substitute script through which they can communicate in printed form. Most cases of dysgraphia involve partially legible handwriting. Such writing is often quite small with many poorly formed letters. Many dysgraphics, however, write large with awkwardly broken letter forms. The most effective teaching attitude is to help the dysgraphic students strive for legibility, not perfection. As with other dyslexics, dysgraphic children cannot cope with pressure and speed. Efforts by teachers to hurry or perfect these, student, these children result only in frustration and an increasingly poor self-concept. Dyslexia in the classroom. Rarely does a child exhibit only one form of dyslexia. Visual dyslexia is usually accompanied by auditory dyslexia, which complicates the teacher's task. It is essential that these factors be identified because, as a rule, only one disability can be corrected at a time. An important characteristic of dyslexia is that multiple stimuli tend to cancel each other out. This means that most dyslexic children cannot master written symbols at the same time that they are drilling on phonics. Corrective, corrective teaching must provide clearly structured sequences which involve one basic skill at a time. 
by moving carefully from one skill to another, most dyslexics can overcome many of their limitations within a regular classroom. If dyslexia is to be corrected, it must be identified early in a child's experience, school experience. Clinical experience shows that time is of a critical factor in solving perceptual disabilities. Follow-up studies of dyslexic st students indicate a rather somber prognosis. If dyslexia is diagnosed before the child enters grade three, there is approximately an 80% chance that the child can overcome his confusion with language symbols. If the, diag if the, if the condition is not diagnosed until grade five, there is a 40% chance of correcting the handicap. For dyslexics who reach grade seven before treatment, there is only about a 5% chance for sufficient correction to enable the students to reach independent grade level proficiencies in encoding and decoding. Obviously, the hopes for successful re remediation of adult dyslexics are small. As the following chapters illustrate, it is not only possible, but also feasible for classroom teachers to discover the three faces of dyslexia among their pupils. When the simple symptoms are recognized early, much can be done within the regular classroom structure to correct these handicaps in children. And there are many references in Dr. Jordan's book from here, there, there, and there. These are all references to the material that was just covered in chapter one. The next chapter is chapter two, visual dyslexia in the classroom.